And Father, we thank you again for these young lives. We thank you for the molding and the shaping of these individuals as they learn day by day. And we pray above all that they may come into that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, wherein they might talk to him at any time, any place, anywhere, and that you would indeed, out of the fullness of your word, give them counsel for their choices, their decisions, your leading in their lives that they may have the most fruitful of experiences as they become your service servants on planet Earth. Bless us all to profit from your truth, and we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It is always good when we have an issue to say, does God have something that he says in his word by way of wisdom to guide us? And uh, I am indebted to... Uh, uh, to Rick uh, this morning. He shared uh, a, a little, he said this is a short one, but he said uh, um, a man and his wife got up in, uh, in the morning and, and they said, now it's you, you should make the coffee. And uh, the man said, uh, no, he said, not me. He said, it's your job uh, to make the coffee. And his wife said, no, God said in his book that the women are to make the coffee in the morning. In fact, he named the book in the Bible after this instruction so we would remember. You remember, he brews. He brews. Okay. <laughs> You've heard that before, or uh, it's uh, something other than. Uh, wonderful to come to the fifth chapter of uh, the book of Corinthians this morning. And as we come to this passage, it's very interesting that uh, we are considering uh, sex education, a uh, curriculum in the school. And certainly of all people, we, we rejoice in God's plan for marriage, God's plan for sex. Sex is a blessing within marriage, and it is to be celebrated. But it is not to be misused or celebrated outside of uh, God's plan and God's purpose. And in our day, we have taken the basics of the one who gave us the guidelines for living and the direction in life, who made the universe and shaped us all to be the best people we could be. We have uh, run ahead of God and said, we live in different times and that's old fashioned and it doesn't work. Well, his word still works today. And if you want good marriages and you want lasting love and you want the excitement and the thrill of this marvelous way of expressing love within marriage to one another, then it is a man and it is a woman who love God ideally, who love each other and who are knit together to raise a family as God would lead them and also to live exemplary lives. We, we look beyond just marriage because marriage in scripture is given as a picture of Christ and the church in Ephesians 5. The world doesn't see this. They don't see the far-reaching plan of God in what he has ordered for us to teach us about his future, his blessing, and uh, all that we are to enjoy in him. And so we realize that as Jesus is the bridegroom, so a man is the bridegroom, and he is the one who is the provider in the home. We realize that the woman is the church in uh, example, in illustration, by way of uh, a picture. And uh, as a result, uh, she and her husband are brought together in a lifelong relationship. There is never divorce that is discussed in the Bible. God hates divorce. That's a quote from Malachi, as you realize. And uh, we realize that there can be divorce, and there is divorce, and we do the best with what happens to us, but always we seek to fulfill the plan of God. Uh, and then as we do have children, there are no better teachers of children than their parents. No one is beyond the ability of a loving parent to understand their child where they are at a certain time and able to help them. Unfortunately, not all parents are attentive to their responsibility 
and they are not given to the responsibility that God has charged them with. But really, parents are the first line of education in any time. We thank God for godly teachers and those who stand to support his word. Well, we come to the fifth chapter this morning, and as we do, we realize uh, that the Apostle Paul has been writing to a very troubled church. And uh, this church has uh, been faced with uh, his concerns, and he talks to them about Uh, the plus resources that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, God has given unto you everything you need for this life and the life to come in any area of life, whether it's finances or health or strength or wisdom or direction or dealing with relationships or whatever it may be, his grace is sufficient for you if we walk day by day, seeking his will in prayer and the reading of his word. God will bless and he will meet our need and he will cause us to rejoice and give us the best of possible lives. Now with that in mind, we understand the Apostle Paul is saying that to this troubled church, that you realize that all that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is because of his grace, his unmerited favor. He loves us even with all of our failures and our stupid uh, reaction to life and our own willfulness and our own sin and disobedience he still loves us and his grace is available if we will repent and we will come and seek his will if we ask we'll receive if we seek we'll find if we knock it'll be opened unto us and God will provide his direction so grace is given because we have been saved by the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is available to any and all in all of their difficulty. Your life can be changed, brand new, made over again, born again to live as God's child forever here on earth and with him in heaven. And then this is all to the glory of God. That's all in the first chapter, you remember, of this book. And as he talks to us of the greatness of God and all that he provides for us, he is telling us that the church operates uh, day by day as a working fellowship to help other people, to bring them to Christ and with the wisdom that God gives. And he talks about the wisdom. There is a wisdom that comes down from heaven. There is a wisdom of this world. Be careful of the wisdom of this world. It's not dependable. It's fallacious. It changes. And we are caught with failure as we follow it. And then as he moves on, he talks to us about Uh, what we should be doing with our lives. And our lives should certainly count for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because one day, as believers in Christ, we will stand before the Lord, not for our salvation, that's not of works, it's a free gift because we acknowledge our sin, receive Christ as our Savior, and what he did on Calvary as the price paid for our sin. But what we do after we receive Christ is of all importance. And we will stand and he will say, in effect, what have you done for me? How have you used your time, your treasure, your gifts, abilities, and talents? What have you done that is of eternal nature? And there will be the test of fire, which I believe is just the Lord Jesus, as it is mentioned in Revelation. His eyes, as he was portrayed, were as a flame of fire. And he looks and he sees and he dissolves and destroys anything that is of empty, selfish evaluation, and he gives to us that which is marked by doing his will, and that is gold, silver, and precious stone, and that which is done for ourselves and selfish outlook and our own advancement, it is wood, hay, and stubble or straw. It is consumed. There's nothing to share, and there is no reward that is given to us with which we can honor Christ who gives us all as his great enablement as we live the life of faith. So as he talks to us along these lines, he said, don't forget, we're workers together with God. We all do different things. We're different people, but we work together that we might build his great plan and his great building. We are a building and we are 
uh, that structure which the Lord exhibits. We are born again. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and he works to make us to be useful and serviceable. Now, all of this in preparation for the real reason. He knew the church was in trouble, and then when he comes to church uh, to uh, chapter 5, he is talking about the real issue in this church that has sparked his deep, deep concern. And so in verse 1, he begins, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, the word fornication here in the original is porneia, which covers all kinds of sexual perversion. It is not just unfaithfulness outside of marriage with another person, but in a sexual way. But it is sexual uncleanness, perversion of any kind. And he said, this is uh, witnessed among your people, people in your church, and particularly a man who is a member. There is fornication in your lifestyle, and it is uh, to be that which is ashamed of, and he names and illustrates and makes it clear, he said, that a man has his father's wife. Now, in the text and in all that is presented here, we would understand that the word of God is always very, very accurate. It is not a son having a sexual relationship with his mother. But it is a man who is a member of the church who, is, who was married to a woman. And uh, as a result, they had a son. And the son was growing up and so on. But either the woman died, his wife, or there was a divorce involved. And with the death or the divorce, there came a desire for another partner. And so as a man who now has been married once, he also has a son who is uh, emerging into adulthood. He is not uh, the youngest of men. And I would think, and uh, it would seem logical, that he would probably prefer another woman who was younger. And he marries this other woman. All right, a divorce or a death and a marriage, there is another Woman, and that is called the father's wife, not the mother of the son. Now, where is the sin? The sin is that, of course, the older man, as I would assume, married to a younger woman, he has his responsibilities and so on, and in the course of life, the younger man has eyes for the younger woman, his stepmother and is involved in a sexual relationship with her, and they either have a live-in relationship or they have gotten a divorce and they have been married. Now, this is very, very wrong, and it is characterized in Hebrew culture as incest. And this is something that is named among the people of God. Why, we know that marriage is for a... Ideally, a Christian man and a Christian woman to be joined together in love for God and in love for each other. That is a lifetime commitment. What do we remember? Some of us, it's all changed now in the marriage vows. But do you remember? Until death, us do part. We don't hear that anymore today. As long as love shall last until the divorce is consummated or whatever, whatever. But this is the circumstance where everything is being reworked and modernized and streamlined to the point where we have no security, just what people feel like having. And this is true with sexual uh, curriculum. What we're talking about is celebrating sex. There's nothing wrong with celebrating sex in its proper place. Sex is for marriage. Sex is not for outside of marriage. Now, we know there are sexual overtones and so on, but we're talking about a physical union between two people, male and female, as God defines marriage here, and it is to be that which is ordered out of love, and it is a not based upon feelings thing. It's a commitment. 
when you make a proposal of marriage, you are saying, I love you and I commit my life to you for life. That's what it's to be. But in these changing days, and we do not have God in the picture, we do not have his word to guide us and to direct us, and we're really making up our rules, flying by the seat of our pants as we go along, and we wonder why we are having so many problems today. So this is the problem, and this becomes the issue that uh, he is addressing here, that the church of Jesus Christ should allow this to happen, and this man still is a member of the church. There is no discipline, and there is to be discipline in the church of God. We understand that. That we, as Christians are brought together into a Christian family, and every Christian should have a church home. Do we understand that? We should have a membership in a church. And you say, well, I might move, or I might do this. No, listen, wherever you live, wherever you find a good Bible-preaching church, you feel at home, this is where God wants you to be, join that church. Why? Because you're part of the family, and you become individuals who are brought in under this family of faith, an umbrella of protection. And being in the church is a great place to be in these days. If you are not a member of the church, you are a lone ranger Christian out there fending for yourself, and you are open to all kinds of attacks of Satan and the world and the flesh, and this is a safety that is granted unto you. You remember Job, and you remember the temptation that came to him, and God was talking to Satan and so on, and there was an arrangement for the testing of Job's faith. And what did God remind him? He said, there's a hedge around my people. And that hedge is enlarged when it comes to people who are part of a church. There's a hedge of safety. There is a place of protection. We are here, and we are in the will of God. And if we move and relocate, we can move our membership to another place of like faith and carry on. But we need to have a church home where we belong, put roots down, and we're not just uh, free as the air and move about uh, according to the wind that blows. So as he mentions here, he said the church must maintain standards and it certainly must support morality and it must support the plan of God for marriage. And that is what we do here. We say we believe And we practice our faith based upon the word of God. This is our authority for all that we do, all that we think, and all that we experience. And therefore, as we perform marriages, we do not perform same-sex marriages. We do not perform marriages uh, between a man and a woman, and neither of them are Christian How can they live according to the word of God, a Christian standard? God, who is the author of marriage, says this is the way for a marriage to be successful. But we don't know anything about God. We know nothing of his word. And, well, we are not abiding by the basics that are laid down. Marriage was not an invention of society or mankind. It was given of God. It was one of the first institutions established And it is so important to the family and the stability, the raising of sons and daughters in an atmosphere of commitment, of love, and through thick and thin, and by the grace of God, we're going to get through the problems, and he promises to be all our help and our strength and our wisdom and our enablement. So in this situation, this is the difficulty, this is the problem, the irregularity that he addresses here. Now, he says there's a second one. Not only have you not disciplined this man and called him to responsibility, you cannot carry on this way. If you do, you are put outside the church. You are no longer uh, under the umbrella of safety and protection as we pray one for another, we help one another, we serve God together. But you are open then to the attack of Satan and uh, his foes. But he says in verse 2, there is not only a, uh, a, a twisting of the, what marriage means and what uh, it's all about with regard to a love relationship and the basis of a family, 
but you are puffed up. You're proud about it. Well, we are progressive people. We are not stuck in the Stone Age thinking of the past. We have advanced to the place where we are beyond all of that, and we are moving ahead into that which is marked by wisdom. Now, this really fit into the church at Corinth, because Corinth was a very progressive city. It was a place of art. It was a place of intelligence and philosophy and schooling. It was a place where the Roman Empire had the best of their troops and the training and all of this. It was a commercial place that was moving ahead. It was uh, uh, one of the cities that was cutting the path of so-called progress in this world. And they said, we are proud that we can work change and we don't have to be lockstep into the pattern of the past. You're puffed up, you're proud. We need to be humble people. We need to be people who are directed and guided of God and, and led of him. Uh, we don't have the answers. We need to ask wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, abundantly, and he won't throw it back in your face that you are too ignorant not to have the answers. He will say, no, you're doing the right thing. Here, I give you what you should do. I bless you for it. And in the face of this pride and in the face of this perversion of marriage and the relationship of uh, parents and children and uh, the twisting and the confusion that has come, he says, we Hold you accountable. Now, that's the problem. And what is the answer to the problem? Well, he, he tells us here. He says uh, in verse 3, For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit. Now, remember, Paul talks in Second Corinthians about the care of all the churches, and he was. And so he can't be everywhere in, at one time in all the places where he's needed. But normally they would have in a situation like this a church meeting and the case would be presented and there would be any kind of defense that was offered and then the, the decision would be made and the man would be put out of the church. You're contaminating the church and its stand and its, uh, its, uh, st its proclamation of the gospel and truth to a lost world. So he says, as we are Carrying on here, we need to do what we do. And I give you the authority, not because I'm present, but I certainly know the case. I have investigated. I understand what it is. And you need to discipline this person. And so as discipline is given, he is to be put out of the church. And it is by unusual Resources. Notice in verse 4, you do what you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of that. That the name of Christ is on this decision because it upholds what marriage is, what people are to do, and how they are to operate and never break these ties. And in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 4, the name and the power. So the church has great resources in their decision-making. And this uh, relates to what Jesus talked about. You remember, whatever the, you bind is bound, whatever is loosed is loosed, that as you pray for wisdom, God gives you his wisdom, and you're able to make wise decisions with regard to church affairs and the conduct of the people. And then he says, you not only put him out of the church, but in the name and in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is a very interesting statement in verse 5. You deliver such a one who has just profaned all that marriage means. You have destroyed the whole significance of it. To deliver such a one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, God is saying, I use Satan to be my disciplinarian. And I'll tell you, anything that Satan touches, he destroys. Anything that you give of your life over to the devil, he will destroy it in the long run. 
He will destroy you through addiction, alcohol, drugs, sex, or whatever it may be. He will destroy you. And he says, this man then no longer has safety, no longer has security of the people of God or the blessing of God, but he's put into the hands of Satan, and Satan, you do with him what you please to do with him. Now, that means to the destruction of the flesh, and that could be his health is destroyed. It could be that, uh, and who knows, uh, in uh, the case here, it could be, uh, and even in today, STDs, it could be through gonorrhea or syphilis or whatever, that this is visited upon him and it destroys him. And this is God's discipline because you have profaned what marriage is all about and what it means. The man is a symbol of Christ. The woman is a symbol of the church. And the, and the woman is subject to uh, Jesus Christ and she is in cooperation with her husband and they, as together they plan and make their decisions for future. They are guided of God all the way. And so... You're glorying, that has to do with their pride. You think you're so advanced, you think you're so uh, up and with it in your own understanding of the world. Listen, this is just backtracking into old sin and slavery, that's all. Anything you do of yourself and in and of without the benefit of God and his direction is failure, it is failure. Your glorying in verse six is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And here is the very simple down-the-earth illustration out of the kitchen and the baking of bread that he says, if you allow a little sin in the church or a big sin, it never decreases, it only increases, and the whole of the organization goes down the tube with regard to its honoring God and the teaching of his truth. So we understand, you know, in the Jewish economy, how they had, uh, well, the, the, uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, Passover, you know what they did. They went through the house and they said, now we need everything clean because we're going to celebrate the Passover lamb and his death, which was a portrayal in Jewish understanding of one who should come and become the Lamb of God that would die for the sins of the people. And so in that circumstance, in all that was going to happen, we don't want any leaven, anything that ferments, that putrefies, that lowers the value of or corrupts what it touches. And leaven here, it becomes a symbol of sin. And uh, it only takes a little sin, a little leaven, and they would take from their baking, you know, each time they would take from the leavened bread a piece of bread and they would keep it for next time. And then that leaven was so powerful, they put it into the dough as they needed it, and that spread through the whole of the loaf of dough, and it caused, of course, the bread to rise. And it was an indication, a picture of sin. And as sin is very small in its beginning, it works out great plans of devastation as it is left unchecked. So purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Don't, don't go on and expect God to bless you for the, what you're doing and you're allowing to happen in the church. The church is to be uh, the... Uh, the land and the mark and the stand of truth and what is to be emulated by society at large. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So Jesus Christ, who was the peerless, sinless Lamb of God, at Passover time came to die and to take our sin upon him, to pay the price for our iniquity, our transgression, the weight that we might be forgiven. That was the arrangement of the Lord Jesus 
and leaven had no place in the pattern of God's plan for our forgiveness. And so he says, I write, I, I wrote unto you in an, ex, an epistle not to company with fornicators. So actually, this is association with people on a regular basis who, whose lifestyle is contrary to everything that the Bible holds to be true and to be exemplary. And so don't hang around with the wrong crowd. They will get to you. They will destroy you as a result. So we have here uh, really uh, the circumstances. He lays it down for us. And then he says, now, here's the correction. You've got to get this man out of the church. But notice that as they commend him to Satan, they are saying, in effect, that he could be a saved man. He could have trusted Christ as, as his savior, but he has gotten off the trail and he's in deep, deep trouble here with regard to his sexual behavior and his departure from what God would have him to do and be. And as a result, there is forgiveness for this man if he will repent and clean up his life and make things right And then he can come back into fellowship in fullness of blessing because he obeys God, he acknowledges his sin, he confesses openly of his guilt, and God is a great forgiver. He always forgives sin if we come in repentance. No one could sin so wickedly, so to such an extent, that God would not forgive if he truly repented of his sin. And so we have case after case in prisons where lifers have become true Bible students. They were born again. They had nothing except life to live in this. And someone said, well, you better read the Bible. They read the Bible. They trusted Christ. They became Bible students. And they are on the inside of these institutions helping other people to become Christians too. God forgives sin. That's a wonderful thing. In fact, all of us have sinned. None of us are perfect. None of our sin lasts. We all need salvation in Christ. So it's available to us, and God will certainly restore and bring us into the path of blessing if we are willing to allow him to do so. So in our own life, what does this mean? It means that we need to be looking after the little things. It's the little things that start out. Just a little bit of leaven is enough to take the whole lump of dough and contaminate it and make it to be uh, red that rises in this sense, in an, in an evil sense. Uh, we need to watch our thought life. We need to watch what we read, what movies we see, or what we watch on television. It's incredible the hold that this stuff gets on us. And with uh, computers and access to pornography, this enslaves life after life after life. And people will live for pornography. They work a job, can't wait to get home and watch pornography. Pornography is more meaningful and thrilling and exciting to them than real life sex. That's terrible. That's so twisted. It is so, uh, it, it is so de- de- uh, defaming. It is so uh, uh, harmful to uh, relationships that we have with wives and husbands and so on. So watch your thought life. It just takes a little bit here, and then you get a little more there. Yeah, I've seen that. Now we go to the new one, and we go this and that, and so on and so on, to the point where we begin to act out what we see. And we become those who are destroyed in the process. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And what applies to an individual Christian applies to the church. And there are times when people do crazy things. There are times when they desert their husbands and they go and live with someone else, even though that they have children. They have children by this other person. Now we've got a mixed family, and neither one of them are committed in marriage. And there is a husband here who is left. And they are trying to work out who has responsibility for this and that and the other. And the ones who 
suffer the most are always the children. They are the ones that get caught and left. They live longer. They have less guidance. They have less direction. So it pays to follow the word of God. And it's very insidious. Satan knows us from head to toe. He knows our weaknesses. He'll just throw it in here and there, and he'll just whet your appetite and take you a little farther each time. And then you get hooked, and when you get hooked, you're on the path. And you become those who fall under church discipline if you are a member of a good church. And the church is obligated to bring before the people, and this is all based on fact. It's not hearsay. You have to have all of your uh, information factually uh, supported, and uh, then action can be taken. So as we live out our life, God wants us to be true people, people who love him, people who are consistent. And when we do it his way, listen, there is no better way. And sex is not for before marriage or with other people. And in fact, sex is wait until marriage for sex. Not easy, not easy, but the best thing. Why? It's a great gift that you give to the one that you love. And this is a gift that you give, and you would never, never share this gift with anyone else. That's what makes it so special. But today, it's just commonplace. And it's not special anymore. It's here and there. It's like an alley cat lifestyle. And uh, we destroy our lives. We destroy all of the future. And we lay a very poor foundation for our children and our families in days to come. Well, may God help us as we come to the table today to say, Lord, you know, is there any little thing, a little leaven here, something that I've been doing, thinking about, I've been involved in, Uh, friends I've run with, this, that, the other thing. Is there something we've been doing that we shouldn't do? We're pushing the envelope ahead. We're doing it. No, no. Why? Maybe we need to back up here. We need to come back to where you say, now wait, the the wait is worthwhile, and it's God's way, and the blessing is there. And then as we keep our lives in check, and that's what uh, communion is about, Lord, search me. Look over my life. Bring to attention where I've been failing, where I've been. Make it right. Ask God for forgiveness. Correct the problems with people. You've insulted them, hurt them, injured them. Go to them and make sure you put it right. But we're going to need correction. We all need to do this. We are not perfect people. We like to pretend we are perfect, but we are not. And we must make amends and do it God's way. Well, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we think of this great city of Corinth, so progressive, so successful, uh, so marked by its art and its learning and its wealth and its accomplishments, and yet here, your church in great trouble because people had not valued your word nor lived by it. As a result, there was need for correction, there was need for life to be changed. And we do not know the outcome, but we do know that the truth was given and that the right thing was done and your work goes on and your people are blessed. Bring us, our Father, as we come to the table to be people who are open and honest and desirous of your best, Lord, not the cast-offs of this world but the best that you have for our lives as we seek to honor you and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.